And then just um, another extension of the, the temporary uh, custody orders. For your purposes, sort of the important documents that you want to be looking at um, are the uh, police report, the workers' notes, and whoever's going to be, uh, obviously everybody's going to read the investigator's report, but um, whoever is going to play the role of the court-appointed investigator needs to you know, be able to be very conversant with what's in, um, what's in those, those two reports. I'm going to divide the class this way. So if you look on the front of the packet, DCF attorneys, I'm going to be looking for three. Um, and obviously the goal is they're seeking permanent custody um, and depending on the outcome of the criminal case, possibly termination. Then I'm going to have three uh, DA, ADAs. One, it's the court appointed investigator. One, guardian ad litem. Now, I, I'm going to have the court appointed investigator and the guardian ad litem sort of be at odds with each other in terms of recommendations. Um, so the investigator, um, you'll note that when you read um, the investigator's packet, that in spite of the allegations, the investigator is looking for reunification. So I'm going to have the guardian ad litem um, recommending, um, you know, possible termination. So whoever plays the guardian ad litem will be, you know, at odds with what the investigator is recommending. And the guardian ad litem obviously also represents the best interests of the children. And then uh, three attorneys for Alicia. Now Alicia's the oldest child, um, and you could put in your notes um, because I don't know if it's unclear as to her age. Just put down that she's 12, and let's make Jason nine and a half and the reason why I'm doing that is because the statute and we'll talk about that later I put it on the board uh, chapter 233 and some of your cases dealt with that but today um, was enacted to allow for out-of-court statements of children under 10 under 10 um, in certain child sexual abuse cases section 81 of 233 covers the criminal cases Section 82 covers the civil, for example, the adoption cases, the termination cases, and then Section 83 covers the care and protection cases. So we're going to have Jason under 10 so we can deal with the statute too. Um, and, and then um, I'm going to be looking for uh, three attorneys for Alicia, three attorneys for Jason, one attorney for Jonathan, the youngest, who's really not that much a part of the petition. However, what, you know, your role is to advocate what, he, what Jonathan would want if he were mature enough to say so. So you might end up, um, as a substitute judgment approach, he, um, arrive at the determination that Jonathan might want to be you know, free from harm and free from possible sexual abuse, or you might end up, and I'm going to leave it up to whoever plays Jonathan's attorney, um, you may end up advocating along with sort of Jason and Alicia you know, for return home. Um, uh, I'm sorry. How old is Jonathan? I think he was like two. He was a he was like a toddler, two, three years old. And then lastly, I'm going to be looking for three attorneys for Lee, and the three attorneys are going to be representing him in both the care and protection case and the criminal case. Um, and just a little bit of an overview, but we'll go into in more detail on on Thursday. Basically, the way this case started was that um, there were actually allegations by a neighbor, and you'll see his name in there, Justin, a young boy that hung out with Jason, um, who alleged that um, Lee had indecently uh, uh, assaulted him. And so the district attorney's office um, um, investigated, and Lee was actually, the day that, um, the day that DCF, I keep wanting to say DSS because of this case, the day that DCF went to interview the kids, Lee was actually in court um, being arraigned. But do you remember this case? No. Oh, okay. <laughs> no, it was before my time. Oh, all right. <laughs> um, I'm thinking like Mark the other day who knew the, uh, all, all the players in the Vaughn case. Um, so, so Lee was in court being arraigned Alicia was babysitting you know, Jonathan and, 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 and Jason, and um, somehow a 51A report, you know, got to DCF and said, you know, 
dad's in court, but there's allegations um, regarding um, not only um, this young boy that, that's the alleged victim in Commonwealth you know, versus Lee, with Justin being the victim, but there were allegations regarding his own kids as well. So it was screened in, and um, both the um, social worker and the policewoman actually went to the home, interviewed immediately Alicia and Jason, um, and actually then removed them, took them while Lee was still in court. Um, so it wasn't, it's somewhere it says screened in, not an emergency, but it really was an emergency, because they, 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 maybe when they screened it in, they weren't, weren't sure, but at the time, while, while he was in court, they took the kids, and then they started making phone calls, and um, initially, um, Alicia, well, there was a, a Lee's mother, there was a grandmother, and there's an uncle, uh, Lee's brother, and, um, you know, between the two households, that's where the kids go initially. Um, but they immediately, after making the alleged statements to the policewoman and the social worker, um, by the time they get to be interviewed, you know, by DCF and the DAs and whatnot, they recanted their statements. And so that's, uh, and their position as older children, mature, they've done well in school and this and that, their position is that to be returned to father. And there's, um, and, you know, questionable regarding um, the, the interviews of them, whether they were leading questions, whether they in fact said these things and whatnot. Um, so uh, again, whoever represents Alicia and Jason, you're advocating, you know, what their, what their wishes are. So, that being said, do I volunteers for three DCF attorneys? <laughs> Who wants to represent DCF? Whoa, already two hands went up. <laughs> Geneva, Stephanie, do I have a third? And Jamie. You guys might have write, just write down on the front of your, where I have the, the rolls. So, Geneva, Stephanie, Jamie, DCF attorneys. Okay, uh, three DAs. Whoa. <laughs> oh, I feel bad now. I don't know whose hands went up the. I think these hands went up the fastest. Kate, Kate, it was Kate, Joe, and Karen. It was Karen. Which Karen? Both Karen. Both Karen. So wait, Kate had her hand up too. Well, she can join us. Why can't you be? <laughs> no, no, I'm not going to make you be the GAL. You want to be the GAL? No. But I don't know. No, yeah, no, no. Let her play a role she doesn't normally get to play. Right. Yeah. Don't put me on the stand. I'm okay with that. Make let her be a defense. Let her be a defense attorney. Yeah, I, yeah. Well, Karen, I think she should be a defense attorney. Karen, I'd, li I'd like you to be Lee's attorney. <laughs> I think that would be a good job. I think that would be a good change because it's the opposite side. <laughs> so Karen Petri, Karen, Karen Petri Key, does actually Karen, advocate for you know parents. That's, that's true. <laughs> so Karen P is Lee's, Lee's attorney, and then uh, Kate, Karen A, and Joe. You two should join me. DAs. Okay. So, so Sandy and Amy are volunteering also to be the okay. attorney. Okay. So Karen, <laughs> Sandy. <laughs> Karen, Sandy, and Amy, <laughs> Lee's attorneys. Going back <laughs> up, I don't have a court appointed investigator yet. How many do you need? How many do you need? Did you have your hand up? You yeah, can be the GAL then. Yeah. So, Mark. It's a good job. Let me make sure I've got everything. Mark is the court appointed uh, uh, um, <coughs> investigator. Tanya is going to be the GAL. Okay. Uh, now, I need three attorneys for the oldest child, Alicia. Uh, 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 okay, wait. Keep your hands up because you'll, if there's four of you, but I'll, I'll, what I'll do is um, e Elaine, Ahmed, and Leslie can have Alicia. Now, Maria, you can, because your hand up, what's next? You can have either Jason or Jonathan. Uh, Jason is fine. Okay. 
So I need two others for Jason, Uma, and Ed. And who's remaining? Who did? Uh oh. Joe. Wait a minute. Is somebody coming this scene today? Yeah. yeah. Abby, Abby, Abby. Abby, okay. She's going to represent Jonathan, and I'll send her an uh, email. Okay, you want me to run through the names just so you're all clear? Okay, ready? Ready? DCF attorneys Gene Geneva, Stephanie, Jamie. District attorney Kate, Karen A., Joe. Investigator Mark, GAL Tanya. Alicia's attorneys Elaine, Ahmed, Leslie. Jason's, Maria, Uma, Ed. Abiba, Jonathan's attorney. Lee's, Karen P., Sandy, and Amy. Okay? When you come in on Thursday, could you change your seating so the, the groups are sort of sitting together? Yes. Because I will act as the mediator, and so I'll be uh, conducting, um, you know, the session. And you know, again, it's mostly attorneys in. In Mark, let's suppose you're a, an attorney, court appointed investigator, who's you know. Um, has done a fair, num fair number of CMPs yourself and so forth, so we can make you a little bit of an expert. Same thing with Tanya. Tanya's a GAL, a, a GAL attorney uh, who does a lot of probate and, fa and family court termination type cases. Okay, so in terms of their qualifications, so we could be make it more like a, a, a legal discussion. So there are no parties here. Okay, only only attorneys, and we're trying to figure out um, what might be. Um, I don't want to say a happy medium, I just go happy medium. <laughs> but um, in terms of the care and protection in the criminal case, can we arrive at any sort of, of, of settlement? Okay. This, and hopefully this, this is a discussion. This is a me well, it's a mediation. Okay. Um, so it's not, not testimony here. Right. Not no, not testimony. I'm just trying to figure out as the the I'll tell you who I am later. I don't know who I am. But um, um, <laughs> I'm at least leading this um, this debate, discussion, mediation, um, and what might come out of it is something that the parties might agree to as stipulations in the care protection and or the criminal case. Okay. And by the way, when I say the criminal case, let me just back up for a moment so you'll know. I mentioned before, so there's an ongoing criminal case with um, the the neighbor boy Justin, but the um, one of the documents that you have in the packet is the information uh, the DA gets um, relative to you know the minute of 51A comes through the department, and if it's a uh, if it's child sexual abuse. The department must notify the DA, so it gets as a referral. So right now, they haven't. Uh, the the um, uh, Commonwealth has not indicted Lee relative to his children, but um, they are certainly um, investigating, going through the process, and that's the, you know that's going to be the probability. So he's got you know one criminal case pending and the other sort of looming. All right. Yeah. So uh, so when. In, in real life, when somebody's got a 51A thing going on, and it's usually sexual abuse or assault, it it doesn't immediately go into criminal law. It has to go through no, the process. No, but the, the, but the Commonwealth is getting all the information. They're getting the 51As, they're getting the 51Bs. Later on, when there's a service plan, they'd be getting the service plan. So accumulating plan. information so they, yeah, preparing for exactly. an indictment. Yeah, okay. yeah, yeah, yeah. Or not, you know, depending on, right. Okay. I'm sorry, where is he in the other case? Justin, he was arraigned. Just a, a you know, arraignment, pre-trial, discovery, that sort of thing. Where are we in the CMP? Where are we in the CMP? Um, right after the um, the 72-hour hearing that he waived, that he waived because there was no 72-hour hearing, um, um, temporary custody to the department. And by, oh, I'm, I'm glad you brought that up. And the children, the three now are living with Uncle Tony, okay, dad's brother. Okay, so it's a relative placement. Um, There's no mom. Oh, mom is dead. 
Yeah, yeah. And by the way, they, they moved maybe within the last year. Yeah, maybe a couple years at the most. They were living. Um, did somebody say something somewhere down south? Oh, it's said something. Yeah, somewhere down south. I forget where, but the mother's deceased. Yeah, now, the, the uncle mother. Tony is that the brother of, of Lee? Of Lee? Yes. Now, just out of curiosity, would it make more sense for the department, the DCF, to consider someone other than a relative of Lee? Like someone on the mother's side? It might make sense, but, <laughs> but that's in, opinion, in reality I what happened in uh, yeah. my uh, yeah. rapist yeah. around the Yeah, you'll, so. you'll learn more about the case. <laughs> <laughs> After we do our mediation, you'll learn more about the case, but that was the initial um, the initial but placement. Kentucky like Domino. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay, let's go through some of the cases you have to read. Um, so that you know you can understand them and hopefully use them, you know, when we do the debate on Thursday. Will this will take the entire class, so we won't yes. have cases. Yes. Be well, here's the thing. <laughs> you, um, we can rattle through maybe almost all the cases between now and two fifteen. Um, even the cases maybe that you haven't read, and I can give you a general indication of what they were about because I think it's important for you to know all of, you know, sort of the rules, the general rules that come out of both the criminal and the civil care and protection and the statute, which I think I placed at the end of the materials. So um, let's just sort of rattle through. I'm not going to ask for full case briefs on any, on any of them, but let's, um, you know, jot down some role, some notes, what the case basically stands for you know, in terms of camp protection and out of court statements and that sort of thing. Um, and I'm going to actually jump around because I think your first case was Commonwealth versus Collin. And notice that what I've got on the board, and I want to come back to Chapter 233, was the statute that I mentioned before. Um, and the Section 81 of Chapter 233 deals with criminal cases. So let, let me come back to Collin. Let's talk about Colin Quentin and Rebecca sort of last in terms of the statutory um, hearsay exception. And let's just start with Eleanor to begin with. So Eleanor was a 1993 case. I have the years because I brought my notes with me today. <laughs> uh, uh, decided by the um, SJC. Can someone first tell me what the SJC st says um, in terms of care protection cases when they go up to the appeals court or the SJC um, on appeal, what is the standard of review? What's going to cause the appeals court or the SJC to, end, to you know, send it back down, reverse it, remand it, and whatnot? Karen? And what, is, what does that mean in the context of C&Ps? That means that um, the weight of the evidence judge had to make a clear error um, in the decision. So like the, the weight of the evidence does not support what the judge found. And, 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 and the judge would have found relative to parents a finding of unfitness. unfitness. So you know, after trial, the judge is going to get the, the juvenile court judge hearing a care and protection case is going to be issuing findings. Um, and those findings have to amount to or have to prove that um, ultimately that the, the parent was was unfit. So the clearly erroneous standards in terms of custody, I mean, they have to be specific, they have to be detailed, they have to demonstrate, um, you know, that the judge has carefully kind of considered all of the evidence um, and that they all sort of amount to a finding, a finding of, of unfitness. Um, it's funny because the, the court also tries to define what clear and convincing means. Um, but it, 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 in the definition, all it pretty much says is, well, it's between preponderance and beyond a reasonable doubt. Um, so that's what you've got, both, you know, what clear and convincing means in, term, in terms of, um, um, of a standard. Now, what about the, um, the evidence of child sexual abuse in, in, in Eleanor? Anybody give me a 
little bit of the facts in terms of, uh, 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 give me a little bit of the facts. Who was Eleanor and, and, and Kate? She was the child. Mm -hmm. um, and I think that they said that she made the allegation and then she later recanted. Um, and the judge went ahead and, and found the mother unfit based on the fact that she wouldn't leave her husband and she was in complete denial about the abuse taking place. And then I believe that the SJC said, based on the fact that there was no corroboration um, or physical evidence, that that's why the judge was erroneous, that you, you can't find a parent unfit when there's well, not the, that evidence. Well, remember the findings weren't clearly erroneous, but the evidence on which they were based just didn't amount to clear and convincing. Right. So, you know, looking at every finding, for example, one of the findings might have been, you know, Eleanor said such and such, you know. Um, uh, another finding, Eleanor recanted such and such. Um, and then ultimately the judge says, well, mom's unfit, right? So the, the, the rule comes out, of, you know, so if you have just one allegation, that allegation ends up being recanted, it's not enough, you know, and in terms of that clear and convincing standard, which is, you know, higher than your ordinary civil standard, basically the SJC is saying it's, it's not enough, you know, you need more. Um, in order to come up with your ultimate determination as a judge that a parent is is unfit. I might be confused in my cases, but didn't DCF try to say that based on the fact that she was in denial about the allegations? It, that happens a lot. I don't know if it was in this case uh, or yeah, not case. Um, it might have been Martha or one of the later, uh, one of the other cases in the package. Yeah, there was one where the they tried to say she was. No, you're right. The mother, no, mother was the mother acknowledged. Yeah. yeah. They, tried, they tried to say that she was. Unfit. Say that. Say that again. Is this the one where the mother supposedly claimed that she was using a, a salve? No. 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 But that's a good point. And uh, in almost every case, when you have you know uh, two uh, a couple and 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 um, there's allegations of, of child sexual abuse. And um, it typically, it's, it, it, it does turn out to be the mother. That, that there may not be allegations that the mother directly abused the child, but if she's quote you know sort of refusing to acknowledge that the other partner has um, in fact sexually abused the child, the children, um, that might amount to unfitness and ultimate determination. Might, it has to be taken together with other factors and whatnot. And typically DCF might have in the service plan, and I think it's indicated in, in, in one of your other cases. Um, you need to acknowledge, and maybe you need to um, either remove yourself from the home, or have your, that partner leave the home before you can have custody of your children back, so yeah. That, that's almost in all of the cases, right, Kim? Yeah, 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 and it's, you know, it's about being able to protect the child. If you can't right. acknowledge that this maybe did happen or has happened, you're not going to be, the parent is not going to be able to take steps to protect the child. So that's the position, usually. Anything else that's important about this case? Can I just, yeah. it, it was her boyfriend, not her husband. So late, what I'll do after we do our um, case study, I actually have the findings in the original case, so you can take a look at them, and you you can determine a if the findings were clearly erroneous, and b if the judge did adjudicate the children needed care and protection and the parent unfit. Um, is that is that determination the, does that determination warrant reversal? Because there isn't. You know, it didn't amount to clear and convincing evidence. It just so we'll go through that in the, in the case study. Yeah. Yeah. Correct, correct, yeah. yeah. So if you go, and, and typically what they do them is they usually do numbered findings. So each finding of fact, you know, so there's findings of facts and, and rulings of law. Each finding of fact, if you take a look at each finding, um, there might not be any, any problems in terms of the factual findings, but then when the judge you know, makes the ruling that 
the children or child is in need of care and protection because the parent is unfit, the argument is that you know they're just not supported by the evidence um, that, that, that that the ruling um, of parental unfitness is not supported and warrants some sort of reversal um, in terms of maybe a new trial or a, you know a, a remand on some specifics of the case. So that, that case was important in terms of setting the, the standard of review. Um, another thing that the case mentioned, um, um, the, the judge's reliance on profile evidence that Flanders demonstrated characteristics associated with child sexual offenders might be appropriate in such circumstances, but it can't support a finding that sexual abuse actually occurred. So all, I mean, some of you may have heard about this whole thing about you know, syndrome evidence versus profile evidence. So for example, when we talk about domestic violence, um, uh, it, it's, it's quite usual perhaps to you know, um, you know, introduce evidence that say um, a wife or a mother or, or, or a partner is suffering from bad woman syndrome or that a child has better child syndrome. But you have to be very careful when you're trying on the other hand to introduce evidence that um, you know, a, for example, that a batterer fits the profile um, of, of, um, of, um, of an abuser. Um, it, it, courts are very reluctant to, you know, it goes to, um, you know, the evidence being um, prejudicial. Uh, it goes to the ultimate fact, you know, can you really bring that in, in terms of, yeah, it, 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 can it really prove the ultimate fact that abuse has occurred because this person might exhibit, exhibit characteristics? So it can be quite prejudicial, um, and certainly in, in criminal cases, it's not usually allowed. Um, care protection cases, when we get to section 83 of chapter 233, you're going to see, because of the nature of the cases, whole parents, patriae, philosophy, the protection of children, um, that um, in terms of balancing and protection, that sometimes the, the care and protection courts and judges uh, might be more apt to, you know, hear things um, uh, that 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 judges in criminal courts would not, because of the due process rights, you know, of defendants being higher in those cases and whatnot. So, uh, Doctor Carlos, also decided by the SJC in 1992. Um, also was a child sexual abuse case. What's important about Carlos? Excited about these cases. <laughs> um, 
just I think that they were the court was talking about whether there was a likelihood of her unfitness compared to the time of trial versus in the future. So at the time of trial, they what do you think was going on at the time of trial with her and her case and her well, compliance with the department and whatnot? Well, she said she was going to get a divorce, but that didn't happen. Okay, you brought up the issue before with in, in, in terms of the, the, the Eleanor case, in terms of the you know mothers or parents' um, um, non-acknowledgement of the other spouse being abusive. Um, so, so why does the petition get denied by the judge? I have to think that one or two things either. He thought that she was gonna come around to believe in it, or that he thought based on because in terms she of was gonna come around, what does the SJC say? She had made significant progress. Yeah, yeah. whatever that means. Mm -hmm. um, I don't think we have enough of the facts of the case in the the, the opinion of the SJC. Um, but what, what you well, I was gonna say that the system, the child's seems to be more traumatized by the separation by, than by the abuse, and he had been regularly visiting his mother, remains attached to her, and is eager to get home. And the, 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 in the end, you have to look at the best interest of the child, and the court was realizing that by trying to separate him from the rest of the family, it was traumatizing the child, it was not in his best interest. And they would, he would be better, I don't know why the courts don't have the authority to force a, a divorce on parents when they <laughs> but the mother was was good for the child. <laughs> but when you have the right to terminate custody, the parental custody, you should have the equal well, right to. Separate. You know, up till now, we uh, we've been stressing you know current parental unfitness at the time of trial. But now you have the SJC looking and and thinking about future parental. Been, at least in the context of termination, not in the context of just custody in a C&P, but you know, taking into account what Mark just said, and, and the, the sort of the extremeness of losing parental rights, um, and that possibly by the time of trial, you know, maybe DCF had um, you know an updated service plan where Mom was saying, well, yeah, you know, maybe this and such and such really happened, and now I'm going to try and do such and such. Um, uh, although the quote is significant progress, but um, you know, I'm not sure exactly what significant progress was. Kim? My experience has been that um, not only did uh, the DCF need to prove the current unfitness mm -hmm. piece, but it was also a, a piece of do you ever think that this mom is going to be able to parent? And that has always been a part of the case and questions right. that I've been asked and that the judge has considered um, in, in a termination trial. So it's both pieces. It's right. like, what's the picture right now and what and is the likelihood uh, that it's going to change? Exactly. Is she unfit, you know, right now? But, you know, has she made some, some, some progress? It, you know, enough so that the goal should not be parental termination right now. Um, the court also, you know, makes some interesting um, um, sort of clarifications of some of these legal rules. Um, parental fitness and the best interests are interrelated factors. I, I, there was a really old case that I may have taken out of the packet, and I can't remember if I did or not, but it was one of the um, um, Wanderers, Wanderers, what was the name? Little Wanderers. Do you have a case like that in your packet? Maybe not, but the, the really famous quote that says that the, the, the fitness test and the best interest test are not separate and distinct, but cognate and connected. So, that, so it's hard to really pull apart and only talk about parental fitness and then only talk about best interest because we're talking about whether you know a particular parent is suitable and able to care for a particular child 
with that parent's uh, sort of um, needs, temper t temperament, etc., and the child's needs and so forth. So, so they are so connected, um, as the, especially in the termination cases. So, you know, on the one hand, you think termination just means the best interest of the child, but it doesn't. It means whether, again, a particular parent is able, uh, ready, willing, and able um, in terms of his or her fitness to a particular child. And you can be fit towards one child and unfit towards another, um, depending on the, the child's needs and interests and capabilities and whatnot, and the parents as well. Um, so that's um, that's Carlos. So you remember Carlos for you know future sort of you know the courts might consider future in terms of termination as well as you know um, that that um, a mother or a parent might might show some slow progress towards an acknowledging that the other spouse may have sexually abused the, you know, the, the child. Um, now Jennifer gets into, now Jennifer is 1988, so it's before 233 was enacted, but it's uh, about out of court statements of children in, child, in a child sexual abuse case. Um, and it's an appeals court case. Uh, what was the holding of the appeals court relative to these? out of court statements. What were the out of court statements? Or in, in what context did they come about, uh, Joe? Oh. Amy, what were the out of court statements? Or just generally, you know, how, how, how did they come in and what was wrong, you know, about that? With the mother statements came in? No, child. child. Yeah, it's out of court statements of, of children. It's the out of court statement of the child, but what, one of them brought it. it was and there were a ton of people teachers, there were right. social workers, uh, um, there was the anatomically correct dolls piece of it. So it's all of these out of court statements that, that came in. But what does the appeals court say about these out of court statements that the judge allowed to come in? Karen A. Well, the judge admitted them, but the judge admitted them as to an exception to the hearsay to show the state of mind. But, but they were not allowed. The question is, why when, why they weren't allowed under the judge's discretion for two ten, and because he substantially relied on this as the only evidence. Substantially, yeah. So you have to be careful because you know this. Tons of, not tons, but there's plenty of hearsay exceptions that arguably DCF could, uh, um, you know, argue the judge, well, you know, Your Honor, the, the out of court statements of the children should come in because they're excited utterances or spontaneous or state of mind. But you have to be careful um, as, the, as the judge then that you're not looking at those statements as the actual evidence of abuse. So, so state of mind could be an important issue in a care protection case. So then you have to be careful in your findings that you're considering them just for state of mind. The problem with this case is there really wasn't much else um, in terms of, um, um, of, of, of evidence. And so if you don't, and, and that's the piece that you're gonna be arguing about on Thursday. If the evidence of sexual abuse is for the most part hearsay, even in the most horrendous cases, it's not going to be enough because you have to have clear and convincing evidence in order to adjudicate children in need of care and protection. Um, the court also mentions um, a fairly old rule that has changed a little bit, and you may have heard about it in criminal law, fresh complaint. Now it's called first complaint. Um, so, for example, in you know, rape in criminal rape rape cases, um, adult um, um, children as well, child sexual abuse cases, um, e evidence can come in, and it would not be, it would not be considered hearsay if the person that's testifying, and typically it might be the police, uh, doctor, or social worker. Uh, in the past, it's also been parents. The Emmeroff case that you'll read. Um, for Thursday, we'll talk about it a little bit if we can, um, uh, for parents. So uh, 
the, the person that, that's testifying is basically saying, you know, so and so the victim came to me and said, which initially sounds like hearsay, it's out of court statement, often in evidence, from the truth of the matter asserted that the person was abused. But the purpose of the person's testimony is to then corroborate the victim's testimony. So it's really evidence of a fr fresh used to be, um, you know, uh, fresh actually um, in terms of time. And I think Emerald was one of the cases that may have been uh, criminal adult cases as well. That it could be, it could even be months afterwards. Even, so the term fresh didn't necessarily mean it had to happen a half hour afterwards. Um, so you know the courts, you know, through um, synthesized rules of cases, came came up with the general rule of what fresh complaint meant. So if the, the if the victim was sort of still suffering, you know, mentally, the, and you know went to someone and said such and such has ha had happened to me over the course of the last year. Um, it still could be considered to be a fresh complaint. Now it's called first complaint. Um, the person, again, whose first complaint to. So keep that in mind also in terms of the exercise we're gonna do on Thursday. Is there any evidence there in terms of first complaint, you know, and, 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 and then could the you know, police officer and or social worker actually testify um, in court as to what the children said. So state of mind is gonna be okay, but it can't be used as pretty much proof of the abuse. It's gonna get thrown out if that's all that you have. Um, custody of Mikkel is not, um, and I'm smiling because I, the way I remember custody of Mikkel is it's the Kate Frosting case. Um, <laughs> it's not a child sexual abuse case, so let me ask you, why do you think I put it in the packet?
guess there was a diary as well that, that came in, right? statements made by the girls about sexual abuse from their father, it usually would not be admissible, but um, the trial court already had parents' convictions for sexual abuse, and there was photographs. So Overwhelming so, evidence, yeah, otherwise. Yeah, so the corroboration was there. Yeah, yeah. So but that piece of it in terms of psychotherapists, if that was error, but what the SJC ends up saying is, it, well, you know, it was harmless error because it was just so much more overwhelming evidence of abuse that we're going to end up affirming, um, affirming the trial court. So another out-of-court statement case, but in terms of the psychotherapist uh, um, testifying. So there might have been issues with the case if there wasn't, you know, the pictures, the, the, the um, criminal convictions and so forth. Because again, you have an issue with, does really a, a, a um, their out-of-court statements, um, and they probably shouldn't have come in, and B, would it have amounted to clear and convincing you know, evidence of unfitness? Sorry, I don't see the difference between the last couple of cases that we had where out-of-court statements were allowed in when they were um, two investigators, and in this case where it's to a psychotherapist, well, the investigator is by statute. And remember when when um, we looked at 119.21, 119.21A, that talks about the, um, um, the um, investigator being qualified as an expert. And um, But it, 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 you're right. There is, in terms of on its face, there doesn't appear to be much difference. However, through, um, through case law, and interpretation of the statute, the courts in Massachusetts have actually allowed, it's almost like another exception to hearsay in care and protection cases for court appointed investigators. Because um, it, it, seems, it yeah. seems to work opposite the confrontation cases, which would state that if something was specifically investigatory, that it would be less likely to come in. Exactly, exactly, yeah. What's reluctant, but you know, as a, a parent's attorney, for example, you can still challenge um, by motions and limine what's in those reports, and you can challenge the sources if the sources can be identified, right? They, um, so that uh, you know, so pretty much, you know, you can try to limit um, if it's particularly damaging to your client, and you know, there are things that you could do to try to get out as much as you can possibly. Um, but that person is going to qualify as an expert, going to be um, um, testifying in, in, in the case. You guys had Rebecca next, but let's hold off on Rebecca Clinton. Where do you end for today in terms Tina. of your reading? Tina. You end with T Tina? Yeah. All right, somebody tell me about Tina very quickly because it's sort of the same. Court case uh, decided in 1998. Actually, um, Tina was decided also after 233, so maybe I will talk about 233 right now. Um, yeah. If you don't mind, can we go back to Colin, the first case in your package? Decided in 1994, shortly after the statute was enacted, 23381. So 
basically, as I said before, 233.81 allows for out-of-court statements of children under 10, right, of an act of sexual contact performed on the child. Um, and 81 is your criminal cases. What does the S now the, the SJC is for the first time speak uh, you know giving guidance now and, const and construing that section of the statute? So what does the SJC say relative to criminal cases has to happen procedurally, you know, in order to to um, you know protect the rights of everyone involved in these proceedings? What is a court? How should a court in the future, according to the Collin Court? How should a trial court in the future, a juvenile court judge, conduct things when confronted with a, you know, a situation where um, the, the DCF is going to be seeking to introduce, I'm sorry, not DCF, uh, <laughs> it's not all over again, Collins a criminal case. <laughs> um, a trial court judge in Massachusetts, what should a trial court, court judge do when you have victims that are children that are under 10? And the Commonwealth is going to be seeking to introduce those out-of-court statements. What needs to be done in order to protect the rights of the defendant and to protect the children? I think the court wants to have other independently gathered information that corroborates the, and backs up substantially the out-of-court statements so that they can... Um, That's a piece of it. There has to be corrupt corroboration, okay? What else must there be? Sandy? There must be a preponderance of the evidence. Meaning what? Um. Okay, so if you're, you're the ADA and, and you're, you know, you're prosecuting a, a, a criminal case, the Commonwealth v. Lee case that we're gonna talk about. Yep. And so you've decided that you're gonna try to introduce Jason's statements, yep. right? What do you have to do procedurally? in order to get those, you know, at trial. So now you're, you're at pre-trial, you're at the pre-trial stage. And you know when you come to trial, you, you're gonna want to introduce those statements, but you want to have the judge, you know, ahead of time, make a determination, make certain determinations about those statements, and make a ruling that they'll be admissible. What do you have to do first, Stephanie? Uh, the Commonwealth must give prior notice to the criminal defendant. Yeah, so remember with, you know, sort of similar to when we read Gall, you know, the, the, this is a huge thing in terms of the defendant, in terms of the defendant's due process rights. So you gotta let the defendant know. What else? And you, who said preponderance of evidence before? Okay, Sandy, continue. Yeah. you have to demonstrate an availability and reliability in terms of those statements before the judge is going to allow, um, going to allow those statements to be admissible. Um, so in terms of, of criminal cases, because you have the defendant's liberty, obviously liberty rights at stake, um, fundamental rights, um, you've got to, as the Commonwealth, kind of jump through a lot of in section 81. So, you know, think, you know, proof beyond a reasonable doubt, for example, as opposed to in care and protection cases, you know, clear and convincing evidence. Uh, so, uh, that's what you've got to do in order to be able to even get a ruling ahead of time that those out of court statements should come in, and that's Colin. So, let's jump to Quentin, which is the middle one um, for civil cases and adoption. Quentin was a termination case decided in 97.
terms of what you have to show to get the statements in. Develop 
into a termination case, but where at its inception and it's a care and protection case. So whoever's representing uh, Jason and the department here, you have to be arguing about the out of court statements. They're gonna they're, they're um, covered by not section 81 or 82, but 83 under the care and protection. And then whoever represents the DA, the Commonwealth, and Lee in the criminal matter, um, if you're gonna make arguments relative to Jason's statements statutorily, um, it's gonna, 81 is gonna be the statute that covers. So right now 82 is not um, part of our procedure. It's, it's either 81 for the criminal case or 83 for the care and protection case. How does 81 not violate the confrontation right? Because of the safeguards of unavailability and reliability. Well, I mean, you have to be, but think about it this way, because we talked before about fresh complaint and first complaint in the nature of corroboration. Right. So you really have to have corroboration in, in some fashion in order to get those blood court statements um, in, in, in the criminal case. Um, so it's gonna be very difficult. Um, so those of you that are going to be arguing about the criminal case, really think about it um, in terms of Jason's statements. Are they going to be able to come in um, under 233, um, under 233 I know you didn't have to do the reading for today, but just really quickly, Marilyn D. Actually, I, you know, I need to jump around. I'm sorry to do this, but... Um, Quite the Iowa was a case that was decided by the U.S. Supreme Court in 1988. Um, and in, 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 in that case, there was a screen, there was a placement of a screen. And may, uh, did anybody read this in con law or any other? No? Um, when, you, when you read the case, you'll see there was a, in terms of the facts, there was a, a screen between the defendant and the child sexual uh, assault victims. And the Supreme Court held then that the confrontation clause um, um, uh, really provided the, the, uh, the um, defendant in cases like that with with the right to you know face to face face to face witnesses. But later on in 1990, well, that was eroded a little bit by the court in Maryland v. Craig that said, you know what, it's really not absolute because of the interest of child witnesses and the trauma and all of that. It can be sort of taken on a on a case by case basis, but the court has to, again, very carefully in terms of the due process rights um, of defendants, make findings of necessity, you know, when you're gonna make any, any um, changes to the ordinary, you know, witness testimony in a criminal case. Um, and in Massachusetts, it's a little bit different in terms of Article 12. The comment will be Johnson, and I know I'm just jumping around, but I just want to give you guys a, 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 an overview for when you read the cases. Um, Commonwealth v. Johnson was um, decided in 94, and, and, and then earlier, uh, Bergstrom, Commonwealth v. Berg, Bergstrom <laughs> was decided in 88. Um, and generally speaking, you know, uh, defendant in Massachusetts tends to have more uh, constitutional rights. For face um, to face. Exactly, exactly, for face to face. Um, when Amaralt, the famous case of Amaralt, that was the, the, the um, Felsaker, you know, nursery school, um, all, you know, hysteria uh, in terms of, and there were lots of nursery school cases that occurred. After that, um, but when the children, um, you know, went and told their parents and then others um, about the uh, alleged sexual abuse that occurred, um, so at trial, those statements came in, and they, they came in generally, you know, as as fresh as fresh complaint. Um, Amaral went through, you know, a, a, a series of appeals and. At trial, actually, there were like little child tables for, for the for the children, and that was one issue that was um, raised in one of the Amaral appeals. And uh, SJC ended up saying that you know, I mean, it, it did um, violate the rights of the defendant to confrontation, but still, you know, sort of refused to um, 
to reverse the case or remand it, so that you know these were arguments that could have been made earlier and whatnot. So you know you want to keep in mind in terms of the the defendants, both federal and state constitutional rights, that um, you know he certainly he or she, whoever the defendant in the criminal case would be, um, has a far greater argument when he or she brings up you know Article 12 and the right to face to face. Um, however, however, that being said, you still have a very young child witness, you know, with other issues such as you know competence and trauma of having to testify, based his his or her um, um, batterer or whatnot. One of the uh, issues that one of the cases brings up and is so true in child sexual abuse that, uh, and this is why the uh, many cases are you know, not crossed and there isn't enough evidence, and it's because of this, it's because generally speaking, that it's the, the abuser and the victim are usually the only parties, you know, um, with any of the facts that, that, that can testify. Um, typically, you know, especially in indecent assault, you know, unless there's penetration, unless there's medical evidence, um, there's typically no, no evidence other than the testimony of a, of a child victim. And when it's within the family, then you have other issues as well. You know, again, the, the mother not acknowledging because of the dynamics, and you might have domestic violence issues occurring with with it as well. Um, the child, you know, um, taking on all the responsibility of the breakup of family and whatnot. Um, so these are very, very difficult cases. And obviously the one that I gave you as a case study was as well. Um, so we'll meet on Thursday and kind of go through. And then if we have time, depending on how long our, uh, our simulation is, we might take it to the next two days in terms of sort of resolving it and letting you know, um, you know, how that case proceeded because there's more history, obviously history after that. You're getting it, you know, as the case as the case began. So we'll begin on Thursday and remember to sit together in terms of your roles, you know, Thursday. Thanks. <laughs> Yeah.